Hi. Hi. Hey, there's no room monitor up here. Um, I just kind of, you know, yeah. in Bynakeen. Okay. Yeah. But listen, you can tell me I'm at the podium if you tell me what to do. So right now I'm looking at the monitor and I just see the, the screen that says room PC view and it's all the panels from the health, from the last track. Yeah. Um, okay, so I actually click on the image. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Can I get, can I get a microphone? Um. Yes. This turns on. I do. I need to get to the next holding slide. Do you know how to do that? Michelle's coming up. Okay. So okay. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four. And then where am I going to sit? Yeah, it, um, they had them spread out before, but I can do it. Because I'm going to sit with them. I think we move the chairs up here, yeah. in front of the podium. Yeah. Test, test. If I could have your attention for a moment, please. Hello, if I could have your attention for just a moment. I'm having difficulty getting your attention, but I'm still going to try. Hello? If I could have your attention for just one second, we're about to transition to the 10 o'clock panel, which is on the ROI for the arts. We have a really distinguished panel, so we encourage those of you that were planning to leave to stay. But we also want to clear the room so that we can get ready for the next session. So thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, and then uh, okay, they're, they're setting good up to go. Uh, five chairs in front, so we'll just... You want, if, oh, you want the high chairs, John? Hi, John. Hi, how are you? Good. You want the high chairs? As opposed to... Uh, we would just pull the low ones, but... Well, what's, guys... what's more comfortable? These are these are probably not that comfortable. You can have the panel. It's totally yeah? up to you. Yeah, okay. Fine with me. Fine. Okay, I'm not good. Uh, you want me to do 2400, though? So let's let's sit in sequence. So if I'm sitting stage uh, left, then it would be you. Um.
then oh, maybe you. Yeah. I was at George Western years ago. Yeah. Millions of people have happened. It's going to be a good one. I'll be coming um, out. Let me see what we're doing. Why are you coming to me? And I was like, we are planning the trip. I'm going to either tell the tourists and have to hear myself. I'll be there. We're going to try to figure it out. Thanks for coming. I'm going to say it for my kids tonight. You can do it in the chat. Yes, because it got me in as an investor. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to call the meeting to order since, uh, as usual at the summit, we're on a bit of a tight schedule. So uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, this panel uh, and to moderate. Um, one of my favorite terms of art is an embarrassment of riches, and that is certainly what we have on stage to my left here today, a really uh, distinguished panel, so I'm looking forward to an extraordinary set of short presentations and uh, discussion. Um, it's, it's a challenge to pack what should be a half a day at least into an hour, and each one of these individuals deserves an hour in their own right to kind of tell their story and give their point of view, but we'll, you know, we'll work with what we have. Um, the question that we were given is, what is the return on um, investment in the arts? Uh, and specifically, what return from both an economic and social level can we expect from investing in the arts and in artists? Which is kind of deliberately ambiguous, right? I mean, uh, I would say we're free to interpret that question as we wish, and I've already instructed the panel that they should really feel free to you know, express whatever opinions they, they want. But... Um, uh, you know, it, it begs the question, which is ROI, what does that mean? Investment from who? Uh, a return for whom? Expressed in what way? What metrics, right? I mean, we could spend a whole day just kind of working towards some kind of consensus about what we mean by ROI in the arts, which is not time that uh, we have. So uh, again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll roll with it, and I'm sure we'll come up with some interesting uh, insights, because uh, based on what I know of the panel, uh, we're in for a really great uh, set of mini presentations and then discussions. So let me quickly introduce the panel so you get a sense of the depth of um, who we have up here on stage. Um, our first two panelists, uh, Rock Schulfer and Kent Nicholson, uh, and we're just proceeding in order, so forget about the uh, order of the pictures up there, are um, people who are uh, consummate insiders in the world of theater. And, you know, we're not restricted to theater, but theater is a really interesting uh, case example of some of the issues that we're talking about. Rock is executive director of the Goodman Theater, which is Chicago's oldest uh, non for profit theater, founded in 1925, and a very powerful voice in the world of independent theater. Kent Nicholson on his left. VP Artistic Services and Acquisitions for Broadway Publishing, which is essentially a, a business for transforming artistic creativity into IP so that it could find its way into performances via licensing, and who has a very uh, interesting and expansive perspective on Broadway. Then we're going to shift optics a little bit. We have uh, Richie Siegel, who is the co-founder and president of the Inevitable Foundation, uh, a nonprofit whose raison d'etre is to advocate for disabled writers, uh, particularly those in mid-career uh, who face barriers uh, to uh, achieving their commercial and uh, creative potential, uh, underrepresented in the industry. And that is an uh, example of a uh, pervasive problem, right, underrepresentation in, quote, unquote, the industry, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be hearing about. Then proceeding further down, we have Angie Kim, who is president and CEO of the Center for Cultural Innovation, another nonprofit founded in 2001, whose catch line, I think, says it all. It's unfettering artists, productivity, and impact, and who has a very broad and interesting perspective on the economics and politics of cultural production. Um, and then finally, we have Kalita Jones, who is um, deeply involved with the arts and innovation policy uh, in Connecticut, uh, who also uh, is involved with the notion of creative evolution in terms of creating ecosystems that uh, are championing of uh, creators, uh, artists, uh, uh, but also uh, entrepreneurs and in various creative uh, fields. So, you know, you can kind of see a little method in the madness here, which is kind of going from a specific set of discussions about and a segment of the, uh, quote, cultural production industry to more uh, expansive questions of representation uh, and also the place of the arts in society around this issue of return on investment. 
Um, a few words of context. Uh, trends in financing are obviously shifting. We're in a perfect storm. Uh, new technologies, new uh, ways to distribute, but also new disputes about who owns what. You know, we're in the middle of a writer's strike right now, and so uh, does you know does the uh, AI have a seat at the table? And probably not. Um, <laughs> Kent, Kent told me uh, on the phone because we had some great pre warm up conversations that uh, the digital. This was. I think really quotable, Kent, you know, the digital agenda is like having fries with your meal, right? So that's interesting. I mean, it's like uh, a lot of people are optimistically looking at the future of ancillary rights and, you know, they're going to be big and it's going to solve a lot of problems. I mean, maybe we'll get to that. Um, but clearly, in terms of the money side of things, there have been cutbacks in public sector financing, a redeployment of philanthropic resources. Um, there's the usual fickle nature of patronage and corporate sponsorship. Um, and at the same time, you get really interesting examples of societal scale investment. I just uh, was in Qatar last week, um, and uh, there's massive investments in what they call the Qatar Media City and uh, cultural production, the Museum Authority, and all this kind of stuff, because they see this as part of investing in the fabric of society. Of course, they can afford to do that because you know they have a, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world for a country of 200,000 people. Um, pretty unbelievable. So. And, and lurking behind all of this, I think, is a, another question, which is how do we water the roots of the arts in general, specifically the careers of young artists who, you know, as, as the new board chair of MOC, I, I embrace the question of, you know, how do you encourage young artists to actually have careers? How do you develop this notion of the artist entrepreneur uh, so that uh, uh, artists uh, or would-be artists don't become victims of a system that, you know, in some respects feeds off of their creativity but doesn't necessarily nurture their creativity in terms of their careers. So in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. The design is we're going to go uh, in order. Each person will have a few minutes of airtime, whatever they want to say, and then we're going to engage in a discussion up here because, as you can imagine, we have different points of view, and that will be fun to kind of deconstruct, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. But before I do that, um, I just have a, a, a question for the audience, uh, or a couple of questions, which is how many of you identify as artists? Wow, okay, great. And, uh, you know, to take a page from Jeff Sonnenfeld's book, that looks like about 62% of the audience. <laughs> um, okay, and then how many of you identify as entrepreneurs but not artists? So a few of you. How many of you identify as investors? Okay, so. Great. OK, so now we, we kind of have a sense of who we have in the audience. Excellent. And with that, without further ado, Brock Chilford. Thank you, John. I, I do want to start out by thanking John and Francis and Midnight Oil Collective for getting the arts on this track at the Yale Innovation Summit. It is a huge deal. I've had an interesting time talking to people who aren't in the arts, who have no idea of how our business works, and are staggered to find that it somehow resembles what they're doing. <laughs> Someone with an idea who's looking for capital and ways to get that idea out um, uh, to large audiences. Anyway. Um, Perspectives from the American theater, which indeed is where I've, I've spent my career. Um, the, the thing about the theater that is kind of unique and weird is that as opposed to opera and symphony orchestras and ballet, you don't think of commercial and not-for-profit activity. But in the theater, we have two distinct branches, the commercial theater represented by Broadway and the not-for-profit theater represented by the, the hundreds and hundreds of regional theaters around the country. Um, in the, in the public consciousness, Broadway is the American theater. Certainly in the consciousness of the New York Times, it's the American theater. Um, the, the, the reality is the business models, even though it's theater in both cases, the business models are completely different. And this creates a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding, uh, working with board members over the years who I mean, I've asked managers, I said, do you ever get the, the uh, attitude from your board that, well, yes, you need money and we'll try to raise money, but you know, if you really knew what you were doing, you wouldn't need money because the commercial theater makes money. So um, these are, the, this is this weird uh, existential dynamic that we're in. So at the risk of belaboring the obvious, the, the 
commercial producing model is profit-based. Uh, it's a producer developing a single work at a time that appeals to a large audience, that's price inelastic, and will run long enough to return a profit to the producer and investors and some good salaries and fees to, to um, artists. It's basically a startup that ends when the production closes. So each production on Broadway is an individual business. Now, the not-for-profit model, in contrast, is, mis is mission-driven with an ongoing organization focused on innovation, affordable prices, and community engagement. Subsidies are necessary given the mission and the cost of these. The, the, the not-for-profit model is really the place where new artists, young artists, diverse artists, new people with different aesthetic ideas, this is where that work should be happening in the not-for-profit regional theater. And to some extent it is and has, and to uh, some extent it hasn't and has fallen behind its mission. Um, it's also important to remember that the, the idea of theater as art, as an art form, is relatively new in this country. It's only about 60 years old. Up until the mid-60s, Theater was Broadway and Broadway touring shows and Broadway road shows and commercial summer stock operations, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until the 60s with the, the Zelda Fitch Handlers and Gordon Davidsons and those who went out to other parts of the country uh, to start these theaters that were based on something other than returning a profit to investors. Now, in terms of ROI, um, you may be surprised by this. The ROI on commercial on the commercial model can be enormous off the charts i've taught theater seminars and lectured on the economics of the arts and and people don't realize that for example the the lion king's worldwide gross is twice the worldwide gross of avatar the mo more than twice the worldwide gross of avatar the most successful highest grossing film so the money and, and Phantom of the Opera and Wicked are also above Avatar as well. There's enormous money to be made. There's also a more than 80% failure rate on Broadway. Um, and a lot of times, productions that seem to be successful because they're running for a long time aren't. They're losing their entire capitalization. They may be meeting their weekly operating costs, but they can't continue on. Um, there's some of my commercial producer friends in the room might disagree, but relatively speaking, there's little shortage of capital available for those who want to start up new enterprises in the, in the commercial Broadway theater, at least in that large scale theater where big returns are, are possible. At the Goodman, we collaborate with commercial producers and we have a list of producers who are interested in doing new musicals with us, collaborating with new musicals that they hope will get to um, Broadway. For not-for-profit theaters, the, the return on investment is supposed to be providing a benefit to society by empowering a wide range of new artistic voices, aesthetic styles, as I said, and attracting new audiences. The financial ROI for not-for-profit regional theaters is problematic since the existing models that were developed at the birth of the not-for-profit industry return very little to not-for-profit theaters uh, for the work that they create, that the artists that they uh, uh, support. Uh, I was talking the other day. I mean, there's a whole bunch of writers on strike who started their careers at not-for-profit regional theaters. And um, they, they're, um, what they've experienced there, I, I think, is hopeful for the future. I mean, there's going, to be, there's going to have to be a sea change because the actors and directors are going to uh, recognize that as well. But the, the, um, uh, so the return on investment for theater artists is, is even a bigger problem um, than it is for organizations. And the, um, the challenge really is the there's this perceived oversupply of labor, for example. So that's one reason. In other words, there isn't an audition call that hasn't gone, you know, uh, without being filled up in the theater in, in any time. Um, in the theater, there's the inherent collaboration. It takes lots. I was talking to someone about creating a musical and how many people it takes to create a musical. And so 
the, the pie gets cut up into a lot of pieces and a lot of individual artists, uh, if they don't have capital to bring to the project, they, they have no uh, uh, real leverage in the, in the deal. Um, and that's, that's challenging in, in an industry in which any not-for-profit theater that's, that's actually trying to pay people any kind of living wage has to raise five to eight million dollars a year. Uh, and a Broadway musical production is, is $15 million uh, in capitalization, roughly, and $5 million for a play. So that's sort of the, the lay of the land. You've got one segment of the theater that has access to capital, that can provide a great financial return. You have another segment that really is the laboratory, the research laboratory for the American theater, the, the place where Again, young artists, oh, that's what I was trying to say before when, I, when my brain went dead. Um, all these playwrights are working for Netflix. Guess how much money we get from Netflix? That's right, nothing. Nothing, or from any of them. Uh, oh, my blood pressure's rising already. I can, I can feel it happening. There's like a, am I looking flushed? Because whenever I start talking about that, I just go berserk. Um, so, I mean, that's... that's a, a, huge um, problem. So, so that's sort of where it's at in terms of the context. Um, and, and John had said, you know, what, asked us to comment on what, what changes, what would you wish to have happen? And I, I guess um, uh, the things, there are just a few things. Um, I don't think that uh, theater practitioners, media, audiences, uh, philanthropists uh, understand the economics of the performing arts. And I won't get into it. I, I do a presentation that I've done around the country for the last seven years. You can contact me if you want me to do it. Um, <laughs> it's been very well received. And it's been staggering to see that even though the economics of the performing arts are similar to uh, the, the health industry, it's the cost disease. It's, it's limited productivity. Uh, we can't keep up with the productivity in the rest of the economy. Costs keep rising at a higher rate, and so a, an income gap is created. So in other words, subsidies are needed not because we're bad at what we do, but because it's the nature of the economic model. And this was first articulated back in the 1960s and it led to the creation of the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, we I'd can give you a reference, by the way, to the document that uh, Rock is oh, okay. referencing, because it's really worth reading. Um, the next thing is, is access to capital. The, the American theater, the not-for-profit theater in America is incredibly undercapitalized. There's just no working capital to do new things on, a, on any kind of really large scale. Um, this, uh, you know, what Midnight Oil Collective is doing, what others are talking about, uh, is really, really exciting. We need consortiums of investors who are interested in both the financial and the societal benefits of the creation of art. You know, they're, they're, um, at one of the panels yesterday, the, I think the, the environmental panel, at the end of it, um, the gentleman said, you know, we can't have environmentalism without humanitarianism. Well, hi, here we are. <laughs> We're ready for the humanitarianism to provide it for you, but you have to give us some resources in order to, to do that. Um, so people understanding uh, what the arts contribute to society. I mean, it is the fabric of our, our society. Um, so access to capital is key. The not-for-profit theater was started because of millions of dollars invested by the Ford Foundation, and the Ford Foundation pulled out, and that was it. I know I'm running out of time, so just two more quick things. Um, using our artists, I'll let you talk about artists and working together on new digital forms. Um, and... Yes, greater embrace of technology before AI makes us extinct. That's it. The, the last thing I would say, um, and I just I use this commercial time. Uh, in our business, there's a lot of talk about the, the providing artists with the right to fail. And that has always driven me out of my mind. My blood pressure is increasing again. Um, I think I even said it earlier today. <laughs> I've, I've never met an artist who wanted to fail. Okay, I, what artists want is the opportunity to succeed, and that's what we need to be providing. 
both in, from a capital standpoint and from an organizational standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. conversation that stuck out of my, my mind, uh, Kent, was you said that there was a opportunity to go beyond the current models and rework them as a spider work network of models so the artist is adequately paid. I mean, feel free to comment in any way you want. But, uh, yeah, that actually teed me up really well, John. You're very good at this, by the way, I think. Right. <laughs> um, I told Rock before this panel I would probably yes and and, and take a lot of what he's saying and maybe put a slightly different spin on it. And I want to start with the last thing because I admitted that I said something that drives him crazy. Uh, and which is to say that the reason in my mind it, that artists need the right to fail is because they need the right to fail. That doesn't mean that they set out failing or with the intention of failing. I, I agree with what Rock said. I, I've never met an artist who wants to fail. The problem is when you're talking with people who are giving you money, the infantilization of the arts as a business, most boards that I've encountered, I was worked in not-for-profits for 25 years, have zero understanding of the arts economy. And that creates a real problem because what they do is they say, well, we know how to do it better and you should be doing this and you should be doing this. I've seen this happen on the commercial side too, by the way, when a very wealthy, successful CEO of a company says, well, I know how to do this because I know how to run a business. But they don't know how to run an arts business, which is a completely different set of problems. And rather than trusting the people around them who've been doing it for their entire lives, they actually say, they say, well, we're going to do it my way because I'm smarter than everybody else in the world and my business has been successful and I see a commercial producer smiling at me right now and that inevitably fails, right? I've seen it happen time and time again, both in the not-for-profit and the for-profit level. So when I talk about the right to fail, I'm talking about it in Silicon Valley venture capital terms. Most venture capitalists don't think twice if a company fails on the, that they've funded because they're, they're, if they're good at their jobs, they, I mean, they may not like it, but the, if they're good at their jobs, they, they have enough spread throughout enough projects that one of them goes or two of them goes and they fund the failures. One of my big jobs right now is acquisitions director. My job is to provide content for our catalog. A good portion of the things that I choose to put into our catalog that I think are going to make a lot of money don't. They don't pay back their advances. That is the same model, in essence. I am successful if I choose well enough that the majority of my pieces make up for the losses that I make, right? That's, so that's one, uh, that's what I mean about the right to fail. If I didn't have the right to fail in my job, I would have been fired within the first six months because there are a couple of, uh, you know, notable failures in my portfolio. And I also have the number one, two, one and two most produced plays in the professional theater in my portfolio. So on balance, I'm doing OK. Um, uh, I, I also uh, want to come back to this um, AI question, because that was something that struck me uh, in hearing Rock speak, and, and talk about the digital stuff. Uh, I think that Larry Summers said something yesterday on his, at his keynote, which really struck me, which is about the idea that EQ is going to become as important or maybe more important than IQ. And I wanted to raise my hand and say, well, we're, we're over here. We're a new track in this venture. There's a bunch of us walking around. You should all come talk to us because the arts are the EQ for a culture. And I, to me, AI... <laughs> me, AI is a tool, and I have no doubt in my mind that it will be used for nefarious purposes because we don't have a very good history of that in our world history. Um, and so there are definitive dangers that go along with that. I'm not blind to any of that, but there is also a tremendous opportunity, which leads me to say I feel like we're at an inflection point in a lot of different ways. Um, I, I can kind of feel it every day. I worked. For, I was saying to Kalita earlier, worked for 25 years in the not-for-profit, and I had to get out. 
I'm not a proselytizer for the not-for-profit. I will say I see its benefits, uh, and I think there are models and things about the not-for-profit that work exceptionally well, and there are things about it that, um, well, you know, that commercial enterprises could learn from as well. But I see a lot of people like myself choosing to go into the commercial world, choosing to try and find new ways of taking content and finding the pathway, the correct pathway for it. The Broadway model is dead. This is a yes and to rock. Sure, I can find a lot of people who will invest, I think Back to the Future, for example, is $25 million capitalization. I've seen the, the pro forma on that. It's going to take three years for it to get paid back. Nobody's going to see a dime, and they have to maintain $850,000 plus uh, weekly gross box office in order to just pay their bills. That's pretty untenable over a three-year period. The only good news to me is if a show runs three years, it runs five. Right? That, I think the data really shows that. If you can make it past the first two years, you will run for five, you will run for six, seven, you will make your money back. But if you can't make it past that first year, which is the hardest time, and don't even talk about January, you better have a good reserve fund in January, you're dead in the water. And if you actually look at the numbers of, our, of the way that all of the not-for-profit, the business I'm in, the margins are terrible. I ask my CEO all the time, I don't even know why we're doing it because we're, we're being set up for failure on a regular basis. So what you're getting are very wealthy people who have the money to burn and are not doing it, which is a form of patronage, right? It's actually not that different from the not-for-profit. And I would say right now, we're probably cannibalizing the not-for-profit's money because the, the failure rate is fairly high. On the positive side of that, the, um, I don't think the failure rate is any higher than Silicon Valley's is. And nobody thinks twice about investing billions of dollars in Silicon Valley. So I look at those two things and I think, well, something's going on here that if we tapped into it, also knowing the amount of money that a Lion King or a Phantom or a Wicked or a Hamilton or a Book of Mormon or, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the number of musicals that have made a lot, a lot, a lot of money over the last 15, 20 years is actually really, really high. And I, f I think it's increasing. Um, we also have cultural trends that are pushing change, that are asking us fundamental questions about the way we do business, which I think gives us opportunity. I think that the old forms of um, of raising capital, the, the way we look at the business models, uh, the the digital. This is this is where the digital comes in. To me, the digital provides opportunity for new forms of distribution. That's the fries with that quote and idea. There are opportunities there that we could take advantage of, and the, in particular, because what I'm focused on, I manage IP. That's what I do right now. So what I'm focused on is if an artist makes money, then I'm going to make money, right? Which is a very investor class sort of way of looking at it. I don't make a lot of money off of what they make. I make less than, I mean, I think if you put an app in the Apple store, you get 30, the app, Apple takes 30%. I don't get that much. Um, but by, by doing that, my goal within my company is to try and find more ways for artists to make more money so that my company can make more money so that we have more profit. We're incentivized to help artists do that. It's, a, it's an imperfect system, but it, but it, and there are lots of problems with it. I will, won't, I won't, I'm not blind to those either, but I will say that I think there's potential inside of that and inside of finding new ways of doing it inside of the technology, inside of the cultural changes, inside of the need, the absolute necessity to change economic models and to figure out a new way of doing it. And also for theater, this is theater specific, but for theater to get out of New York City. I used to say Charles Isherwood when he was the, the second critic at the New York Times was the de facto artistic director for the American theater. 
and that's less true now with Jesse Green, which is a good thing because the New York Times is, uh, the power of the New York Times in terms of its criticism has gone down a little bit, uh, particularly post COVID. But when Isherwood was the person whose job it was to cover all new work, and so he could say yay or nay, and every artistic director in the country would, um, would, would say yay or nay to that play based upon what Charles Isherwood, and they hated to admit it, but I could show you the data of how a play rose or fell dependent upon its New York Times review. And the last thing I'll say about that is just from a theater specific viewpoint, and I rather imagine it's this way, and this is to bring it down more into a community kind of level. There are 6,000 community theaters in the United States. 7,000, thank you. Thank you, Benny. Hey, Good to see you. Um, uh, 7,000 community theaters in the United States. So there are prox. I'm sorry, 10,000 community theaters in America, 7,000 of which are organized under the American Association of Community Theaters. Right, 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 which is actually the American Association is where I was getting my figures, which were obviously wrong. Uh, but, but even more, right? There are also approximately 3,000 professional or semi-professional theaters in the United States. There are also, I think, in the tens of thousands of high school programs or high schools that produce a play in the United States. So there's a huge market out there for what I do, which is manage the IP of playwrights, right? And it is not being capitalized in a way that it could be. And we are not, as an industry, from the top down, as aware of what's going on around the country and how we could feed our work into various communities in order to continue to get money into artists' pocket. Because the more their work is seen, the more known it is, obviously, the more money people make, which is which is what I'm concerned with. So I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to maybe give a little bit of background, just kind of moving, I guess, off of theater into film and television a little bit. Um, so I'm one of the founders of Inevitable Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit started about two and a half years ago, uh, focused on helping uh, disabled screenwriters reach their full commercial and creative potential. Um, just to share you know, some depressing statistics about the state of, of representation. Um, disabled people are the largest minority group in America, over 20% of the population, 25% uh, of adults, um, but represent about 0.6% of the Writers Guild of America, which is on strike now, as we've alluded to, um, represent only 3% of upper level TV writers. And to me, the most depressing stat um, of all is, some of you might know there's something called uh, is working. Uh, it's called first look and overall deals. And a first look and overall deal uh, is when a studio says to you, hey, we really want kind of a, a semi-exclusive or exclusive uh, take on your output of film and television, and we're going to pay you millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. So if you think about the Shonda Rhimes of the world, the Greg Berlantes, the Ryan Murphys, these people are paid incredibly well um, to do that. 0.1% of those deals go to disabled people. And so if you said to me, do disabled people have any creative power in Hollywood, I would tell you basically no, and our goal is to really focus on changing that. Um in the last two years, we've spent a lot of time building writer granting and mentorship programs, building research and advocacy uh, campaigns. But the place that I and, and a lot of my team have been spending a lot of the time recently is, is really looking more at these like structural models of, of how um, these writers are not getting power. How could they get power? How could they make money? Because they're not making money. Um, and it, it's a really kind of tricky place. Um, you know, television specifically, there is no such thing as independent television. Financing a television show is an incredibly expensive endeavor. Um, I mean, the only thing I guess you could think of is like PBS or like public access, but otherwise there is no such thing as independent television. Film, on the other hand, there is independent film and it's been vibrant for a while, but um, you know, the festivals have really been struggling. I think COVID was a huge blow to places like Sundance and others. Um, and so you're in this place now where a lot of the, the studios have all the power, they're putting all the money up into these things and they're all also taking all the gains from it. Um, and the writer strike is we've been talking about, you know, there's an interview with one of the old uh, lawyers at the Writers Guild who basically said, if you think about the model we have right now, 
Uh, imagine someone built a house 80 years ago, and every three years, which is when all the guilds renegotiate, they added a new room to the house. And now you look up and it's 2023, and you're like, this is the worst designed house ever, but it's the only house that we have. And we're at the place now where someone needs to basically knock the entire house down and rebuild the house, but you don't really know if the right people are around the table, if it's the right time uh, to do that, when, of course, people are trying to make up for you know inflation and, and solve issues like AI, which are very serious, but are not necessarily structural in the way of how projects are made, content is sold, bought, created, et cetera. So um, we've been spending a lot of time really looking at, you know, one, we are a nonprofit, but we're building for-profit entities under the nonprofit to give us a lot more flexibility and freedom to go pursue some of these more commercial activities. Um, two, how do we look at uh, different kind of co-op-like elements to really think about how we can realign the risk that writers take and that studios take and financiers take um, and really think about, you know, I, I, we've been talking a lot about unicorns in, in Hamilton and so forth. And I spent a lot of time in the consumer good space before this and, you know, spent five years looking at all these direct to consumer brands like Warby Parker and Bonobos and Casper that some of you are all probably familiar with, um, try to build these billion dollar brands. And by and large, they mostly failed because the cost structure was so high, the goals were so big. And we've been thinking a lot recently about singles and doubles versus home runs and thinking that if for a lot of diverse populations, if you need to build the track record of success, I think we look at a lot of you know, if you look at a lot of diverse TV shows, they've all been canceled after the first season, the second season. They're not getting the opportunities. And so if we want to build a track record, yeah, we could go try and get unicorns and home runs. But I think there's a lot of risk to that model versus if you think about singles and doubles, um, can you build some of the track record to then go start thinking about how you restructure the model? And you've elevated people along the way that now have track record and backing and credits behind them to do that. So um, that's where we're spending a lot of our time. We're in the process of building a production company, raising development funds and doing all that underneath a nonprofit. Um, but I think similar to maybe other people up here, I have a lot more questions than answers at this point, um, given there are just tons of structural problems. So I'll pass it to Angie. I'm going to try to tee it up because I actually really want to hear from Kalita. Um, there's a reason why I'm pointing that out. Is this not working? Oh. Um, thank you. So I'm Angie. I run an organization. It's a nonprofit um, called Center for Cultural Innovation. We are actually part of this, hopefully a trend of looking for the solutions that are not in already established models. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're judging older models, but we think that there have been a lot of artists who have been left behind and excluded um, and frankly discriminated against within our own industries, whether it's commercial or not for profit. And I'm not naming anybody. I'm just saying that's just the system through professionalization, academics, et cetera. Um, I'll give you an easy example. Our nonprofit, through the support of institutional foundations like um, CERNA Foundation, which Javier is in the room who was uh, recently there, we actually are investors of Midnight Oil in a not nonprofit investment term deal. Um, regarding ROI, I would just say that for us, we do all of this work for a return where we are trying to shape our entire national cultural identity to be reflective of the diversity in society, which it is not right now. So that's why I actually want to cede more of my time to you, Kalita. Thank you. Great. Hi. So I just want to say first, my, my opinions are my opinions. So take with them what you will. Just know I'm about to activate some stuff. <laughs> um, nonprofits, great. And it's broken. It does not serve people of color. That's why there's so many grassroots organizations that are popping up all over the world. Because we see that there are systems preventing us from being our authentic selves. Our identities are compromised. They're fractured. And that's a big part of why my colleague and partner, Doug Clayton, and I started Creative Evolutions. We are a liberated for-profit. We believe everyone should be compensated for their time, including people who show up to the interviews for the large organizations. We believe that everyone should be compensated because everyone is pouring value into everything that happens. The return on investment for the arts, in my opinion, look at the last three years, friends. We weren't here. 
All of us were being activated by the arts via technology. Organizations across the world were scrambling to get online and keep people engaged and excited and driven and loving the arts, loving classical music, loving pop music, loving visual art, loving theater, loving spoken word, loving poetry. All of us existed on that. That's the return. All of our mental health was compromised. It's still compromised, let's keep it honest. It's still compromised, but we're still working to show up for everyone, right? So it's strange to me that we in the field of creative, all of us that are creatives, I identify as a creative, I'm a violinist by trade, but I'm a creative. It's, it's strange that we're still begging to be seen. <laughs> We're still begging for money. And we forget that hundreds of years ago, there were brilliant scientists, brilliant astronauts, brilliant doctors who were all affected by the arts. They would not be who they are without the arts. Maybe they don't play the violin. Maybe they don't act anymore. Maybe they're not a visual painter anymore because they don't have time. But that impacted who they became now. So I think we're, I, I believe we are at a point now where it's like, I don't want to sit at your table. <laughs> I'll build my own. I don't want to follow the rules that are put in place because I can't even get in the rooms to talk about the rules and share why they aren't working. So I think until we literally, and I'm saying it publicly, blow the whole thing up and rebuild it collaboratively with everyone in this room, the system will stay status quo. And my kids, who I don't have yet, and my grandkids will continue having these panels and conversations about what's the return on the investment. And I want to echo, I think it was Kent who said, there's no issue bailing out these banks, y'all. There's no issue, but for some reason, we have a really difficult time with actually investing in people and censoring people, censoring humans. And that's, that's an emotional thing. I feel that very deeply. And because I, I recognize my privilege, I was raised by both of my parents. They made a sacrifice so that I could play the violin, so that my brother could play the violin. I recognize my privilege and my responsibility to speak up unapologetically. Everything I said, I'm a, I say what I say person. It might hurt some feelings, but it needs to be said. And it's 2023 also. Like, we're not in the 70s anymore. So can we, can we actually like, can we do something where everyone in this room is affected in a positive way and actually has the funding to do really great work, can we stop recreating the will and actually collaboratively build together and, and determine what does collaboration look like? Because until that happens, we're not going to stop building. We'll make our own tables. I will take my toys and go to another sandbox and find some new friends to play with. But it, it's, I'm, you know, I'm saying it in jest and I'm saying it lightly, but it's enraging. <laughs> that we're still here, that we still have to beg for funding, that we still have to beg in grants. Like, why is the grant process so impossible to get $500? And you got to write a five-page paper on why you had the $500 to begin with. It's enough already. If you can't visually see or hear the outcome of what's happening in your community, you're asleep. Wake up. I'm done. <laughs> So I love Richie's notion of uh, building a house because it seems like we've built a house with a lot of different rooms here. And as I hear it, there are a number of themes on the table, which explains why, you know, this uh, panel, uh, I think, uh, could have benefited from a couple more hours. But we've talked uh, clearly about um, how to get the right kind of money to the right places. Oh, well, thank you. I'm not done yet. Um, uh, how to pay for uh, creative work which has authenticity, um, as opposed to uh, you know the increasingly narrow band of uh, sequelitis and spectacle spectaculitis and so forth and so on. Um, how do re we reimagine the whole thing as a system? And um, interestingly, and you know, I speak as a kind of an organizational guy from time to time, what's the belly button for change? I mean, everybody perceives change from their own point of view. We have kind of limited time here, um, and, and I want to bring to the table a question that MOC is very much involved with, which is how do we foster the careers of young artists, whether they become full-time artists for the next 50 years of their lives or whether they incorporate their lives into sort of a more hybrid career path? Because um, one thing that I think disturbs all of us at MOC, should disturb all of us, is that if you don't water the roots in terms of the human equation, the e EQ equation, the uh, aspirational equation, and instead um, make the leap from uh, the aspiration to the realization, 
virtually impossible or extremely difficult, like winning the lottery, or you don't equip young artists with the tools to be able to, uh, in some respects, uh, own and direct uh, and speak for their uh, aspirations, then what have you got? So how do we nurture the roots uh, in terms of uh, fostering young artists? Maybe that's a, a good place to uh, open I'll, things up. I'll just ask who's nurturing those roots? Well, because yeah. that, that, I mean, I think that's a big part of it, the who of who's nurturing it, and it has to start from the very beginning. It has to be built into the process. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be in between the steps of growing the artist. It, has, it also needs to be walking in tandem with, with individuals. And that who piece is really important because there are cultural differences that will actually affect how people grow within business understanding, resource understanding, and who are they speaking to in the right rooms. So. Um, one of the things that we do at our organization is that we have um, embarked on doing advocacy work around artists' social and economic conditions. And so when we talk about nurturing the roots, a lot of times I've been in the artist funding field for over 20 years. We've been a bit too treetops. We've talked too much, and it's not to say we shouldn't about living wages, et cetera. We, those are all important conversations, but I would turn it all to everyone sitting here to basically also understand, like, we have to get really political about the decisions that we make. For artists to be artists, whether or not they compete in any one of the systems that we represent, they all need basic social protections, and it is eroding in America. And so for any one of the people who raised their hand and said, I'm an artist, there's also right next to you, behind you, in front of you, all these other people outside of the arts who are now living the artist's condition of high amounts of student loan debt or debt overall, thin credit files, financial precarity through gig work. I say all this to say that we are all culpable and we are also all have the potential to change what this means to actually give people benefits and protections regardless of their employment status. Until we do that, it makes it really difficult for us to have the kind of thriving cultural expression that reflects who we should be as Americans. Well, um, my wife is an actor and has been for many years, and the and she's very highly regarded in the industry, uh, but has never had a consistent breakthrough in the film and television world. So the economics have been ba and she loves to work in the theater, uh, and the economics suck. Um, the uh, uh, so. For me, I'm 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 more concerned about the state of the actor because there are hundreds of schools around the country training actors for jobs that don't exist, or if they do exist, um, they are paying a minimal amount of money, and uh, it's it's really unconscionable what's happening because these these. They're trained to be actors, but they're not trained to understand what the what the business is and what they're getting into. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the the, the um, and again, going back to perceptions of board members of audiences, audiences see someone on stage at a 100 seat theater, and they think, "Wow, they have a professional life in the theater." Then I realize that person making a hundred dollars a week doing that. Um, you know, we, we just have a, uh, an industry in which the people who we rely on for support have no idea, as Ken said, how, how the industry works. And uh, it's, it, we've got to change that in every possible way. So not to turn uh, Kent into our quote master of the day, but uh, you also said something uh, to me which was, I thought, really evocative, which is now almost every artist is a multi-hyphenate. And that resonates with MOC's agenda, which is to really engender the notion of the artist entrepreneur, because in some respects, you can't wait for somebody to give it to you. You have to create it uh, for yourself. So we have seven minutes left, and I thought, you know, we'd allocate a couple of minutes uh, more to the panel, and if there's any burning kind of uh, integrative comment that anyone wants to make, and then turn it over to you for some commentary, and I'm sure we'd be happy 
once uh, 11 o'clock rolls around to uh, assemble outside if you want to interact with the panel who are obviously um, So any uh, last minute kind of? Can I actually tag on to the MOC observation of the artist entrepreneur? Sure. Um, the reason why we invested in MOC is actually because it's a cooperative. It's a cooperative of artists that are basically a risk pool in and among themselves. And so capital like ours, which represent a bunch of, a bunch of different institutional funders, Hewlett, Cerna, et cetera, it basically is us backing the artist's risk. It's a risk pool. I say that to also say if we, one of the sort of mantras is artists need to get more sophisticated about their business practices, that they are a small business. We actually do training on professional practices. I, I agree with all of that. But I also think that the messaging is really damaging, that you're in it to be competitive against all of your peers. We are in a neoliberal paradigm in America that has been so harmful, that has basically said everybody's in competition with one another, and it's your self-production self against everyone else. Why we like Midnight Oil Collective and others like them is because we're learning as artists what it means to look to each other as neighbors and be accountable to each other and actually figure out more microeconomics at localized levels, whether that's in geographies, cultural communities. We also followed African Americans into the blockchain with NFTs because they've been the most extracted from in emerging technologies um, and how they are also creating risk pools. So I just want to make sure that one of the things that as we applaud Midnight Oil Collective and around the entrepreneurship is also to look at them as a model of how artists can cooperate together. Maybe uh, popcorn style comments from the audience. Any comments, reactions? Um, uh, anyone? Yeah, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Malachi Eason. I'm the director of programming for the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. And um, just to answer your first question, that I would love to encourage everybody to do when it comes down to community artists and people who's in your community, just always give them opportunity. So many times we hire people who are like all around the world, but you have a lot of talent in your community. So how we can foster those artists is to hire people in our community. That's it. Yeah. 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 Other uh, comments or reactions? Anyone? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> So it is what it is, right? And so we, we did our best. But the other thing I want to comment on is that 
you know, the, the participants in the panel were, were given to us. We didn't actually sit and brainstorm for a month or two and say, well, let's kind of get the demographics perfect. And I think, you know, the panel is diverse. Um, it just so happens that, you know, a couple of people who are speaking to, let's say, more established social models happen to be, you know, more from a particular demographic. That, to me, is it's a reflection of what you're saying. 